I believe in evolution. Maybe a world government, it, we will evolve to it. Maybe there's no hope, but we have to evolve to it because the world gets smaller and smaller because of technology. Uh, computer chips on every physical item manufactured on planet Earth. The latest technology for identifying people at the point of sale, for identifying people when they make purchases, is actually the implantable chip that you can actually embed directly into human flesh. Uh, it's a tiny glass capsule about the size of a grain of rice. It contains an RFID computer chip uh, with a coiled antenna, and it can transmit information also at a distance. A microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement. There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that, mark my words, before your tenure is over. Homeland Security folks, uh, the Department of Defense and others have uh, expressed an interest in being able to more closely monitor the U.S. populace. And one way to do that, of course, would be being able to determine who buys what and uh, where they take those things. Radio waves can travel through walls, they can travel through wood, they can travel through the things we normally rely on to protect our privacy. Uh, for example, your purse, your backpack, your pocket, anything you're wearing or carrying. Kraft Philadelphia cream cheese has been tagged with RFID and sold to consumers, as have uh, Mach 3 razor products and other Gillette razor products, without the knowledge of the consumer. One of the tiny chips could actually even be the, the, the dot on the letter I on the back of the fine print on a package that you purchased. They were talking about having reader devices in every airport, on every bus, on every train, on every port, on every dock. One of the most worrisome applications of RFID are proposals to put them into cash, meaning that you would be able to track every banknote, where it had been, who it had been issued to, and create, in essence, an audit trail. That would, that would um, essentially take away the anonymity of cash that we now enjoy today. The ATM machine itself, as the money was, came through the, the roller device, would be, would be reading each number. And they would know who you are because, of course, you identify yourself at the bank before you take money out. And down the road, when you go to pay um, at a major retailer, it would also be possible for them, as they're putting the money into the cash drawer, to simply feed it through a little reader device. It would go in, it would uh, tag that number and transfer possession from Aaron Russo, say, to Walmart. Once everything you do is tied down to a single number and there is no longer the ability to pay with cash, then all it takes to render you a non-citizen is to simply turn that chip off. You will no longer be able to really participate in any function in society, including by food. So through the implementation of the Federal Reserve System, the American citizen has gone from being a private individual who had real money, gold, in his possession that was private to a citizen who has no privacy because all money is now being digitized. They can deduct whatever amount of money they want out of your digits whenever they want. They can trace you whenever they want. You'll be at their mercy. God forbid we allow this to happen in America. This is absolutely Orwellian. I mean, it's talking about Big Brother looking over your shoulder at absolutely everything you do, every purchase you make, every place you go, um, every company you interact with, all of that would be reported back potentially to the government. One bank, one army, one center of power. And if we have learned anything from history, it is that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is Aaron Russo, a filmmaker and former politician. To his left is Nicholas Rockefeller of the infamous Rockefeller banking and business dynasty. After maintaining a close friendship with Nicholas Rockefeller, Aaron eventually ended the relationship, appalled by what he had learned about the Rockefellers and their ambitions. Uh, I got a call one day from um, an attorney woman I knew, and she said, would you like to meet one of the Rockefellers? I said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, we became friends, and um, he began to divulge a lot of things to me. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there, and and out of that event, you're going to see we're going to go into Afghanistan. So we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East. And we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, and get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish. And uh, they said you're going to see guys going into caves looking for <laughs> looking for people uh, that they never.
they're going to find. You know, he's laughing about the fact that you have this war on terror. There's no real enemy. He's talking about how by having this war on terror, you can never win it because this is, so it's an eternal war. And so you can always keep taking people's liberties away. And I said, how are you going to convince people that this war is real? He said, but the media. The media can convince everybody it's real. I mean, you know, it's just that you keep talking about things. You keep saying it over and over and over again. And eventually people believe it. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror. And now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie. And now they're going to do Iran. You know, and it's so one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now I would say, to him, why? Do you, what are you doing this for? What, what? What's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. It's, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and take care of your family. And then I said, so what's the ultimate? What, what are the ultimate goals here? To the ultimate, the goal, the ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the chip with the RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off the chip. That's right, microchips. In 2005, Congress, under the pretense of immigration control and the so-called war on terrorism, passed the Real ID Act, under which it is projected by May 2008, you will be required to carry around a federal identification card, which includes on it a scannable barcode with your personal information. However, this barcode is only an intermediary step before the card is equipped with a Verichip RFID tracking module, which will use radio frequencies to track your every move on the planet. If this sounds foreign to you, please note that the RFID tracking chip is already in all new American passports. And the final step is the implanted chip, which many people have already been manipulated into accepting under different pretenses. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. In the end, everybody will be locked into a monitored control grid where every single action you perform is documented. And if you get out of line, they can just turn off your chip. For at that point in time, every single aspect of society will revolve around interactions with the chips. This is the picture that is painted for the future if you open your eyes to see it. A centralized one world economy where everyone's moves and everyone's transactions are tracked and monitored, all rights removed. The most incredible aspect of all. These totalitarian elements will not be forced upon the people. The people will demand them. For the social manipulation of society through the generation of fear and division has completely detached humans from their sense of power and reality. A process which has been going on for centuries if not millennia. Religion, patriotism, race, wealth, class, and every other form of arbitrary separatist identification, thus conceit, has served to create a controlled population, utterly malleable in the hands of the few. To think something so small can connect you to everything that matters. When your life and all you love are on the line. Elflick is always with you. When every second counts in the emergency room, providing immediate access to your medical records. Because Bob has trouble remembering all his medications. Because I'm in love with my kids' kids. Because my car lost control while driving. Because now I'm looking out for both of us because I have diabetes, but it doesn't have me. Because I spend my life in the ER trying to save yours.
Characteristic film, humans injected with a tiny chip holding the key to all of their private information. But as you're about to see in our CBS 46 investigation, it's not fiction. In fact, it's being marketed in Georgia as life-saving technology. So why do some experts say it's potentially deadly? CBS 46's Kim Fedick investigates. It's used in key cards, prepaid tolls, even checked luggage. It's called RFID technology, or radio frequency identification. Small chips that store information. So, here's the chip. And now that same technology is literally available in the flesh, with chips injected right into people's arms. It says it burns a little bit. That's about it. Atlanta firefighter John Santola was injected with the chip about the size of a grain of rice. When scanned, the number on the chip is linked to a database with Santola's medical history. I think it will help me uh, in case of emergency. Santola was chipped when Florida-based Verichip Corporation set up a booth at an Atlanta firefighter conference. They market the chip primarily for safety reasons, storing medical information for first responders, Alzheimer's patients, even children. And it is the only product that has been approved by the FDA for this specific purpose. The FDA approved the use of chips in humans in 2004, but since then it's caused quite a bit of controversy with some consumer groups, concerned about privacy, even health concerns. These are very powerful tools especially if they fall in the hands of a, as somebody with political ambitions. One of the loudest voices of opposition is right here in the Boston area, a Harvard doctor and author of spy chips. These technologies will not make us safer. I think they'll make us sitting ducks for Big Brother. Dr. Katherine Albrecht also compiled 16 years of studies. She says prove the chip can cause cancerous tumors. It's clear as day that these tumors were not only malignant, but they metastasized, they spread to the lungs, the liver, the thymus, the, the, the brain. These pictures show the tumors growing around the actual chip in the mice and rats. Certainly the company, I mean, they, they've done, I think, a, 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 a tremendous job of keeping that information under wraps for the last several years. We sat down with the chief medical officer of Verichip and asked about the link to cancer in mice. Yeah, I, I am not aware. I mean, I would have to take a look at uh, what, what's, being, uh, what's out there right now. I'm not aware of any, any issues at this point. But weeks later, Verichip sent 26 pages of literature claiming the incidence of microchip-associated sarcoma in rodents is very low and claims the mice in at least one of those studies were genetically engineered to be tumor-prone. No doubt in your mind that this is safe for us medically. Yes, I mean from everything that I've seen, um, I, it, it's, it's very superficial. It's been in the animals for 20 plus years. John Sintola won't need to worry about the cancer debate. His chip fell out after two days. Would you get it again? I would not get it again. To me, this is the future of medicine. But how far in the future? Well, Verichip advertises the technology in use at eight Atlanta area medical facilities, including Crawford Long Hospital, Emory University, and DeKalb Medical Center. But our investigation found that none of these centers are actually using microchip technology. For full copies of studies done on microchips and humans, log on to CBS46.com. I'm Kim Fettig, CBS 46 Investigates. Hey, I have enough trouble with religion anyway. I think religion in its own way is the root of all evil. You notice every war is fought over religion. Wow, that's a pretty subversive statement, Governor. What about religion? But, but uh, well, I have a problem there too because I've now admitted I'm an atheist. And in this country of the United States, which is fascist now in my opinion, is organized religion teaming up with corporations to control the government. In the United States, there's some prevailing feeling out there that because you don't believe in the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, or God, uh, these, this being you can never see or it exists only in your mind. I would counter this. How about all these numbskulls out there that don't believe in evolution? Swine flu, there's your classic example. There's a virus that evolves and it will come back again. Once we fix this one, that virus will re-evolve. Re 
Uh-oh. I do it now and it'll do it again. Now we're going into a whole all other these territory. People, all the, wait, all these people say evolution, it's just a theory. You know what I answer back with, Gretchen? What? So is gravity. That's just a theory. If you don't believe it, go jump off the building and see if it's real. I would say this. Any theory on the origin of life on the Earth, or any other planet as far as that's concerned, is a fairy tale. A fairy tale, pure and simple. Life from non-life, apart from God's direct intervention, is a fairy tale. But despite that obvious truth, evolutionists continue to build their supposedly scientific case on a foundation that virtually rules out everything that follows after it. Evolution teaches that energy, such as lightning or heat, plus matter, can occasionally create new life. Yet our entire food industry rests on the fact that this can never happen. If we examine a jar of peanut butter, it contains matter and is exposed to light and heat. But we never find new life inside unless an outside life contaminates it. If the theory of evolution was viable, then I should, occasionally, by subjecting this to energy, end up having new life. Now we go down to the store, and um, if, if I open this jar of peanut butter, maybe not often, but on some occasion, I should find new life inside. And so, when we open the jar of peanut butter, we look in there, there's no new life. And, I, and, and aren't you glad, okay? Now, um, you may smile at this, but hopefully you'll never forget it because you and I conduct, uh, collectively, over a billion experiments every year, and we've done that for virtually a hundred years, and we never encounter new life. In fact, the entire food industry of the world depends on the fact that evolution doesn't happen. Didn't you used to be an atheist? Yeah, I did. I used to be a devout atheist. And that sounds a little strange, but I was committed to my belief that God didn't exist. And this really wasn't based on anything other than what I had learned in school. I thought that evolution was responsible for everything that's around and that God was something that people just invented in their minds as an emotional crutch or as some sort of an answer to the questions that they couldn't figure out themselves. And I've since learned that when you really look at the evidence, the truth is, it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to believe in God. You've really got to ignore the facts. Well, it's funny how we equate the word atheism with intellectual, when yeah. it's the exact opposite. That's right. Kirk, I have an, uh, an intellectually stimulating theory. It's my theory of where the soda can may have come from. Billions of years ago, there was a big bang in space. Nobody knows what caused the big bang. It just happened. And from this bang issued this huge rock on top of the rock was found a sweet brown bubbly substance and over millions of years aluminum crept up the side formed itself in a can then a lid and then a tad and then millions of years later red paint blue paint white paint fell from the sky and formed itself into the words 12 fluid ounces do not litter you're saying what are you doing you're insulting my intellect and so i am because we know if the, if the can is made there must be a maker if it's designed there must be a designer to believe the soda can happened by chance is to move into an intellectual free zone. It's to have an echo when you think. It's to have brain liposuction. Hold this, Kirk. Behold the atheist's nightmare. Now, if you study a well-made banana, you'll find on the far side there are three ridges. On the close side, two ridges. If you get your hand ready to grip a banana, you'll find on the far side there are three grooves. On the close side, two grooves. The banana and the hand are perfectly made one for the other. You'll find the maker of the banana, Almighty God, has made it with a non-slip surface. It has outward indicators of inward contents. Green, too early, yellow, just right, black, too late. Now, if you go to the top of the banana, you'll find, as with the soda can makers, they placed a tab at the top, so God has placed a tab at the top. When you pull the tab, the contents don't squirt in your face. You'll find the wrapper, which is biodegradable, has perforations. Notice how gracefully it sits over the human hand. Notice it has a point at the top for ease of entry. It's just the right shape for the human mouth. It's chewy, easy to digest, and it's even curved toward the face to make the whole process so much easier. 
Seriously, Kirk, the whole of creation testifies to the genius of God's creative hand. Oh, it absolutely does. You think, think of the human eye. Uh, it has 40,000 nerve endings and focusing muscles that move more than 100,000 times a day. The human eye has over 137 million light-sensitive cells. And even Charles Darwin himself said, To suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. So even the, uh, the uh, creator of the theory of evolution says it just goes against my common sense and logic. And so many of these guys uh, that we think were atheists weren't actually atheists. No. I mean, Einstein wasn't an atheist. He, he objected when atheists used him to, to say that atheism was a genuine thing. I mean, Einstein believed in the existence of God, and, and right. I think even Darwin did. What we're going to do now is, is teach you how to prove the existence of God, how to actually make an atheist backslide. When I look at a building, how can I know there was a builder? Can't see him, hear him, touch him, taste him, or smell him. So how can I know there was a builder? Well, the building is absolute proof there was a builder. I couldn't want better proof there was a builder than to have the building as evidence. I don't need faith to believe in a builder. All I need is eyes that can see and a brain that works. Now, the same deep, rich scientific principle works with paintings and painters. When I look at a painting, how can I know there was a painter? Well, the painting is absolute proof there was a painter. I couldn't want better proof there was a painter than to have the painting as evidence. And the same principle works with God. When I look at creation, how can I know there was a creator? Well, creation is absolute proof there was a creator. I don't need faith to believe in a creator. All I need is eyes that can see and a brain that works. Scripture, Romans 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. It's obvious that a building can't build itself, it has to have a builder. A painting can't paint itself, it has to have a painter. And the same with a car. Here we have a well-made automobile. Now check this out. It's got a nice body, it has a steering wheel, it even has a horn to let people know that you're coming through. Now, check this out. Someone thought to put a windshield on it to keep the bugs from hitting you. How glad are you for that? It's also got windshield wipers to smear the bugs across the windshield and squirters to wash them off. Now, think of it. Think of a well-made human being. We have a body. Our mind and our will is like a steering wheel. We have windshields. We have windshield wipers. We even have squirters to lubricate the eyes. Think of it. Everything about us has been made with purpose in mind, from our nose to our mouth, our teeth, our ears, perfectly shaped to capture sound waves, our hands, our feet, our muscular and skeletal systems. It's been made with purpose and design. Is it really intelligent to say that this car has no maker, that it just happened? How much less intelligent is it to say that the human body has no maker and there is no designer? Speaking of design, I believe in physical fitness, as you can tell from my physique. And for many years, I ran to and from work every day. Actually, my office is about 10 feet from my back door, but I did run that distance. And there was this huge avocado tree that continually dropped leaves. One day when I was running to work, I stopped for a break under the avocado tree. And I looked down, and I saw there were seven leaves on the ground. So I bent down and put them in a straight line. Went into my office and sat down and waited for my wife to come in and say what I thought she'd say. It was very predictable. She walked in, sat down, and said, What did you put those leaves like that for? See, there was no way her reasoning mind could believe that seven leaves fell off the avocado tree and fell into a straight line of seven leaves. She knew that an intelligent mind, mine, had put them there. And when you look at creation, we see order throughout the whole of creation from the atom through to the universe, the flowers, the birds, the trees, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything has order to it. Let's look at it from a different angle. If I say to you, there is no God, that's called an absolute statement. In order for me to make an absolute statement and be right, I have to have absolute knowledge. I have to know everything about that subject. Let me give you an example of another absolute statement. If I say to you, there is no gold in China, in order for that to be true, I have to know 
everything about China. I have to know what's under every rock. I have to know what's inside of every rock, inside every jewelry store, and what's inside every Chinese person's mouth to see if there's any gold in there, in a filling, in a, in a stone, in a ring. I have to have all knowledge of China to make that absolute statement that there's no gold. However, if I want to make the statement there is gold in China, I don't have to have all knowledge of China. I just have to have a little knowledge. I just need to see one person's gold filling. I have to see one piece of gold and I can say with confidence there is gold in China. So for a person to say there is no God, to make that absolute statement, they have to have all knowledge or be omniscient. And nobody is. Even the brilliant scientist Thomas Edison said, We do not know one millionth of one percent about anything. When I meet an atheist, I like to give him the atheist test. I say, can I give you the atheist test? He says, yeah, go ahead. I said, it begins with two questions. Kind of strange questions, but they're most necessary. The first question is, could you please tell me how many pieces of sand are on the combined islands of Hawaii? He goes, what? I said, do you know? He says, no, I don't. Second question, can you please tell me how many hairs are on the back of a fully grown male Tibetan yak? He says, what? I said, do you know? He says, no, I don't. Now these are necessary, these questions, because there are some people who think they know everything. God used a similar principle with Job. He asked Job 70 questions, one after the other, until in essence, Job laid his hand upon his mouth and said, boy, I hardly know anything. So here is the test. Let's say this circle represents all the knowledge in the universe. Someone who is omniscient, who has all knowledge, knows everything about everything. They know how many hairs are on every head, every thought of every heart, Every atom is splayed before them. All history is before their eyes. They know all about the secret love life of the fleas on the back of Napoleon's great-grandmother's black cat. They're omniscient. They know everything. Let's say, Mr. Professing Atheist, you know an incredible 1% of all the knowledge in the universe. Is it possible in the 99% of the knowledge you haven't yet come across, there is ample evidence to prove that God exists? And if you're reasonable, You'll have to say, well, it is possible in the knowledge I haven't yet come across, there is ample evidence to prove that God does exist. So he's forced to say, well, with the limited knowledge that I have at present, I've come to the conclusion there's no God, but I really don't know. That's right. He's not technically an atheist. He's an agnostic. He's a person who doesn't know if there's a God. He's like the person that looks at a building and says, I don't know if there was a builder. We're now going to go to a clip of a real live atheist. We found one, Kirk. You did? Yeah, yeah. So watch, watch what happens. There's three things to look for. One, watch for the fact that he changes his mind about the existence of God when we reason with him. Two, watch for that deliberate swing to address his conscience, where we say, do you consider yourself to be a good person? And then three, watch when the Ten Commandments, the, the law does its work in pressing against his conscience and causes him to begin to justify himself once he realizes He's done wrong. That's right. Why, why are you an atheist? Uh, my, uh, my beliefs, I, I look at things uh, very practically speaking, I guess. Uh, uh, I like to have proof that that things are the way they are. So it's hard for me to uh, just take some information that someone tells me and believe that it's true unless unless I have proof. Do you have a car? Yeah. What make is it? Ford. Ford made it. Ford made it. Yeah. Do they make your car? They're the maker. Right. Do you believe your car happened by accident? Could you believe that, that no one made the car? No, I don't believe that. So obviously everything made like a car has a maker. When you look at creation, don't you think to yourself there must be a creator? There's flowers, birds, trees, sun, moon, stars, there's seasons, the human eye, the mind, everything has intricacies and it's, it's uh, wonderfully made and it has order from atom right up through the universe. Don't you think someone who said no one made the car would be lacking in brainery for someone to say no one created creation just doesn't make sense it's not logical do you think that's a fair argument 
Yeah, I think there's a point where you, you have to step back and just say, well, okay, maybe someone did create uh, all of the elements around us, but I think that, uh, I, I believe that evolution did take place. And uh, I think you can always step back before evolution and say, well, someone put all those elements in place in order for evolution to take place. Would you consider yourself to be a good person? Yes. Can I ask you a few questions to see if it's true? Sure. Have you ever told a lie? Sure. Okay, what does that make you? A liar. Have you ever stolen something? Uh, as a kid. What does that make you? I guess a, a thief. Uh huh. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Sure. Okay, but that's using God's name as a cuss word. It's called blasphemy. And the final question is, in this respect, Jesus said whoever looks at a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Sure. Okay, Chris, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterer at heart. And you've got to face those, God on Judgment Day. Those are just Day. words. You've got to face God on Judgment Day, whether you believe in Him or not. Big if. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, would you be innocent or guilty if He did? Well, if all that's true, I'm guilty. Would you go to heaven or hell? I guess if you uh, believe in all that and it's all true, I'm going to hell. Now, does that concern you? No, because I don't believe any of that's true. If I stepped off a six-story building and said to you, I don't believe in gravity, I just don't believe in it, do you think it's going to change reality? That's real, though. How do you know? You can't see gravity. But you can test it. Yeah, and you're testing the law of sin and death. If you die in your sins, the Bible says, you have to face a holy creator who's seen your thought life, who gave you a conscience, and he's going to judge you by the secret sins that you've committed in darkness that nobody's seen because he's a God of justice. But you know what God did so you wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? Just whatever the Bible says, I suppose. What do you think he did for you? It's something really wonderful. He died for me? Jesus died on the cross for you, oh. taking your punishment. That's what the Bible teaches. And it's called the gospel, and it means good news that Jesus paid your fine so you wouldn't have to come under God's wrath. Chris, he defeated your greatest enemy, your greatest fear, death itself. And all you have to do to see if it's true is obey the gospel. Repent. Don't just confess your sins to God, but turn from them and trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. Put your faith in it. And the moment you do that, God says He'll forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life, and you'll pass out of death into life, and you'll come to know the God that you, you just didn't know existed. Wouldn't we all be sinners, though, if I'm a sinner? And wouldn't we all be going to hell just like I am? Because, I mean, really, I'm a, I've never committed crimes where I've ended up in a jail or I've never had to go to a a court. I've never been tried by anybody. Yeah, but Chris, so yeah, I'm a good person, I think. I have a, a family and I've been married for uh, 17 years. I have four kids. I you know, work hard. I, I, I uh, make my own way through life and uh, I'm, I'm friendly and courteous and truthful to people. And, That's uh, true, Chris. So yeah. now, so how bad or how good do you have to be to uh, to not be a sinner. You had to and be perfect in thought, word, and deed. So, how many of us are perfect? None of us. There's only one that was perfect, the Son of God. So, see, so... So we all need the Savior. We all need to repent. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth. And Chris, you said you're a good person, and by man's standard, that's true. There are plenty of people worse than you. But God's not going to judge you by man's standard, which is very low. He's going to judge you by holiness, and justice, and truth, and righteousness. And you are in a prison. And you're facing capital punishment. You're waiting to die. We've got a big blue roof here with good, good air conditioning and good lighting. But you're waiting to die. You're on death's road. One day death will seize upon you. And that's because God's proclaimed upon you the death sentence. The soul that sins, it shall die. Now God offers you a reprieve and your wife and your children. If you love them, open your heart and say, God, I need to know the truth because I don't want to wait till I'm bearing a loved one before I open my heart to you and ask things that, about things that really matter. So think of your family and how you should lead them into the knowledge of everlasting life and your wife. And, and if you've got all these blessings, you should be abounding with thanksgiving to the God that gave you life and not denying his existence. You should be saying, God, I'm so sorry I've lifted my back to you. You've lavished your goodness upon me. My brain, my eyes, my wife, my children, my health, this wonderful free country we've got. God, I yield my, my life back to you. And he'll transform you on the inside and make you a new person, give a new heart with new desires. And they're cowards. I'm on record of saying our judicial system in this country today is a bunch of cowards.
time ago I can still remember how that music used to make me smile And I knew if I had my chance You know what? I think there's a conspiracy in the world wrestling entertainment I think there's a conspiracy, Cena Pleasure to come back to Raw here in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you, Hershey. Appreciate it. Now, as we talked about earlier, I am a governor. I don't belong to the Republicans. I don't belong to the Democrats. I am the Independent. And I am the governor that stands for revolution in this country, demanding a revolution. It's a revolution, and a revolution means new. The governor, Jesse Ventura, he promised this would be a revolutionary event. It already has been. We just saw a revolutionary match. One of a first of a kind to see a bump falls out of the other side of the ring. And we Global cover-ups. Mind control. Secret societies. You don't think this stuff is real? Think again. I've heard things that'll blow your mind. I've been on the inside, and now I'm ready to talk. Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura. The news Wednesday, December 2nd at 10, only on True TV. Not reality, actuality. Be a guest star on a conspiracy theory, that's what it is, right? Uh, well, or maybe, uh, I'll give you that. I'm sure there's a lot of conspiracies here in the WWE with you in charge. No doubt in my mind there's plenty of conspiracies going on. No, 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 no. What I got... You know what? I think there's a conspiracy in the world wrestling entertainment. I think there's a conspiracy... I had almost forgotten this. And, and, and then it popped in my head. Tyrell called me last Monday and said, oh, boy, the uh, David Icke thing didn't go too well. And I said, well, he was in the show two seasons ago. It was very fair. And he said, yeah, they just, it, you know, it just didn't go well. And he, just, he was just letting me know what had happened and because David had put out a big article. And, and I admire Governor Ventura. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Ike is a very charismatic guy. I believe what he's saying. And I appreciate his work as well. It's sad to see what happened. But, Gov, you never talk about the TV show until it's out. But, obviously, this information is now out. So I want to ask you, uh, you went to interview Ike in, in uh, what, Pennsylvania? Cleveland. Uh, oh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and uh, what happened there between you and David Ike? Well, uh, he just, uh, I don't know, he got all offended and told me to F off and walked off the interview simply. I was asking him uh, questions about his expertise, and that's reptilians. And, uh, you know, I, I go from a point of, you know, there is no dumb question. If I don't understand it, it's certainly not dumb to me. I was trained that way by Chief Warrant Officer on, on, in demolition when I went through uh, Navy SEAL training, and that's how I've lived my life. And apparently he doesn't like to be questioned on anything that he believes in or anything that he espouses, and I think that's ridiculous because if you believe in what you say, then you should have no problem discussing it with anyone. And uh, I just found him to be one of the worst interviews I've ever possibly done because he's not forthcoming at all. Well, uh, he had been sick, um, and uh, I've, I've, you know, I almost wish you guys via Skype could do it again and and you know try it one more time because you know two years ago you guys had a positive positive interview with him, and you know he's really great on so many issues, and I'm just uh, I mean I know this you you guys were intending just to do 
a fair interview, correct? Absolutely. I, everything I did on that episode pointed to going to him to get answers, but getting answers from him is impossible. He well, that's what, want that's what Stan says. I, I told him, I said, oh, no, they, they want to do an open-minded thing, and you're basically the star of this episode, this, you know, this interview, and, but it, it is reality, so sometimes things get, things get crazy. I, just there's so few of us that are really questioning reality and the officialdom. And, uh, but, well, he um, gets away with it because he tells you right at the opening thing, he looks right at you and says, nothing is real. Nothing is what it is. So when he opens that door, that means he can say anything he wants, and he doesn't have to defend it with any facts or anything because nothing's real. And you it's know, laughable when somebody says that to you, or to me anyway. You know, we ought to get you and I on this radio show for a debate. That'd be that'd be interesting. <laughs> I had my, you know, I don't think I'd care to. I, I don't think it would go anywhere, Alex, because he he obviously took great offense to me, and I don't know why. I, you know, all I did was ask him questions that were pertinent and things that I wanted to get hopefully answers well, to. I just want to see you guys patch it up. Uh, hopefully before it. you go to Mexico in the next month or two, we can talk about it. But it, it's a side issue. I just uh, No problem. I mean, I don't lose sleep over it. He goes on and I go on. He's making a lot of money, that's for sure. What was the question you raised that he got angry at? Any one of them. <laughs> there wasn't one. It was the whole interview. You know, I think he misunderstood reading his article because he said that he sat there for an hour and that he wanted to meet you and they didn't bring him in. I don't think he understood that with that, you know, with, with real reality TV, they don't they want to keep you guys separate so the meetings knew. I, I, if you read his article, which you told me off air, you have it. I think I think he took it like like it was a setup. He didn't know that the lighting guys were just as usual taking their time. <laughs> Well, I don't know anything about that, you know, and I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, you know, I'm I'm there. I was there to interview him. He clearly didn't want to talk to me about anything, and when he did, he wouldn't answer any questions. He attacked me. All right. Well, God and, listen, uh, I want you, know, you to have a great like time down in Mexico. Be safe, and uh, I know you're talking to libertarians off record. Uh, you might run, huh? No, I wouldn't hold my breath on it. I've just spoken to them, and they've spoken to me, and the lines of dialogue are open. It's not anything farther than that. They'll have their convention in early May, and at that convention, they will decide who's going to be their right. candidate for the, uh, the 2012 election. Jesse, thank you so much. Okay, Alex. Hey, house? there's a fucking guy here telling me I got a schedule, asshole. He's using dirty language, asshole. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Bye, tough guy. Bye, tough guy. <laughs> and thanks for your service to our country. You're welcome. Thanks for touching me with your fucking stupid rip riff raff from fucking Rocky Horror hairdo. <laughs> You're bigger than me and stronger than me, so what? I don't give a shit. You want to beat me up? Go ahead. Oh, I'm not going to fight a guy like you. I, that means nothing to me. I argued with you, you put words in my mouth, and you didn't like what I did it to you. You put words in my mouth saying, I didn't believe in the Constitution, and that's bullshit. It's not true. I don't agree with uh, uh, abusing it. It's interesting. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. If, if you die, what are you doing? I mean, are you doing anything to sort of look beyond that day or what to do here in terms of finding out the truth about the afterlife? And what are you doing and what do you think I should do to determine what's right and what's wrong and how I should live my life because we're going to die? I think that we're all, that uh, I at least, and I presume you, are looking in ways that we feel are right, that we feel are just to find out such things should we think that they're valuable. But to those that don't think that it's a valuable thing, more power to them. They're still doing what they feel is right, and that's really all that I can ask of anyone. So if I felt it was okay to pull out a gun and shoot you, in the universe, is that really okay? Well, at that point, you're violating um, a lot of... But if it's what I want to do and it feels good and it's okay, you understand the point I'm making. I'm not trying to hammer you on I'm just saying, I'm saying we can't really even, ultimately we got to draw a line and say murder's wrong, man. Please don't murder me. That's wrong. Don't steal my wallet. Oh, here's what I'd like to claim then. It's not so much that to do what you feel is okay, but um, that we draw certain lines. And, the, and where we draw those lines is where you start bothering other people, where you, where you can swing. The, the great example that I know is that you can swing your fist as long as it doesn't hit someone else's face, right? And so anyone believing what they will, as so long as they're not hurting anyone, is a fine thing, is a completely fine thing, as so long as they're not hurting other people. So have you ever, have you ever lied? 
We're not going to go down the Tenth Amendment road. Oh, okay, but but the point I'm making is just to answer to address your point. You did hurt the person that you've lied to. You deceived them. Well, not necessarily, but if you've deceived somebody, if you've ever stolen something from them. A deception is not necessarily harmful to the person that you're lying to. Have you ever harmfully deceived somebody else? I've, I'd have to think about it, but I'm going to say yes because I know that I, you know, mess up. Okay, and, and this is the last point because you said you had to go. Um, you can answer if, if, you, if you want to. According to the Bible, not according to, to, to me because my opinion really doesn't carry a whole bunch of weight in the universe. The Bible says it's the Word of God, and it says that all sin is against the Lord. So if you swing your fist in the form of lying, stealing, or lusting, or failing to put God first, or hating somebody, or failing to honor your parents, you are connecting with God because sin, according to the Bible, is against God. You see, people will say, are you saying it's wrong to look at a pretty girl? Well, no, it's not wrong to look at a pretty girl or a handsome guy, but there's a big difference between looking and lusting, and your conscience knows the difference. You see, lust is simply pornography of the mind, or as the Bible puts it, adultery of the heart. And there are those that say, well, pornography is not hurting anybody. And in a sense, it's true. You can look at a photo, a pornographic photo, and nobody gets hurt. Nobody even may know about it. But the Bible tells us all sin is against God. When Joseph in the Bible was tempted sexually, he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and prayed a penitent prayer, he said, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And when the prodigal son spent all his substance, all his money on prostitutes and riotous living, he said, I have sinned against heaven. So sin is primarily against God. And say, when does immoral pornography become moral pornography? Is it when the girl's 11, 12, 14, 17? He says, yeah, yeah, when she's 17, it's okay. So well, can't you see that your love for lust is clouding your moral judgments? God says looking with lust is committing adultery within the heart. I think it's simple to understand why many people have a problem with Jesus saying that lust is the same as adultery of the heart. And that's because most people know that they're guilty. Kirk, once I was preaching open air and a guy walked past, heard me talking about the things of God and called out, I love sex, and went off laughing. Well, duh. I mean, who doesn't love sex? The point is, sex is a gift given by God for both procreation and enjoyment. But what God says is, confine your sexual activities to within the bounds of marriage, not the lady down the street. And it's interesting to note that you can enjoy the marital pleasures of sex literally thousands of times and never risk sexually transmitted diseases. But God says if you get out of that, then you're sinning against him. Even if you lust after a woman, you're sinning against him. People like to think that just because something brings us pleasure, it must be good. Kind of like the song that says, it can't be wrong because it feels so right. Well, the truth is, that's just not the way that it is. I mean, someone could go in and rob a bank and feel great going in there with guns a blazing, come out with millions of dollars, feeling strong and powerful like they're a hero. But that doesn't make it right. So pleasure is not a good criteria for whether or not something is right in the eyes of God. And the fact is, Kirk, lust gives a man pleasure. It's his darling sin. And there's no way unregenerate man is going to let go of his darling sins unless he understands that he has danger. But the truth is, like you said, the law of electricity, we don't run around saying we hate the law of electricity, although we know if we stick our finger in a light socket, we'll fry. We don't hate the law of gravity, even though we know if we jump off a building, it's not going to soften its principles. When we hit the ground, we're going to perish. We respect it, and we fear it, and we let it work for our good. And in the same way, if we respect and honor the Lord and His laws and have a healthy fear of God, it can work for our good, cause us to turn from our sin and realize the incredible grace and mercy God has extended to us to save us from hell. You know, Kirk, um, in a sense, I sympathize or empathize with non-Christians that may be watching or people that we share our faith with because if I was listening to this program, I'd be thinking, boy, lust has such a grip on me. I cannot look this way or that way without lusting. Yeah. And yet the Bible says, that God will make you a new person with new desires, and that's the miracle of the new birth. It's not called being born again just for the word's sake. We truly are born again. God makes us new creatures. In fact, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's exactly what's happened with me and with anyone else who has obeyed the gospel, who's turned from their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ to save them. God warns that he who covers his sins shall not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. And so that's what we need to tell people to do, to confess and forsake their sins. So in summary, the seventh commandment is one that we shouldn't shrink back from using, but to bring it to people and show them that if they've lusted in their heart, that's adultery in the eyes of the Lord. This is what Jesus did. This isn't a method that we've come up with on our own. Jesus used the commandments to bring the knowledge of sin and prepare the way for grace. That's why we call this show The Way of the Master. Um, what do you love most in life? Love most in life? Uh, life itself. Me too. That's a good answer. Yeah. yeah. So you love life? Yeah. Most. Okay. Anything comes after that? What do you love in life? Uh, probably women. I mean, being at the beach, seeing all these women in bathing suits and stuff like that. I would have to go with the same thing. Uh, definitely women. Yeah. <laughs> women? Yeah. They were a good idea, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, let's go through some of the commandments and see how you guys do, see how you do on Judgment Day, okay? Have you ever told a lie? I've told a lie many times. Me too. Yeah. Have you ever stolen something? I've stolen something. Yep. No. When I was little, I've yeah. never stolen anything. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Uh, yeah. S yeah. 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 Uh, Instead of using a filter word to express disgust, you've taken the name of the God who gave you life and used it as a cuss word, which is called blasphemy. Now here's the one that will nail you to the wall. Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Well, when you asked me about what did I like, I said women. <laughs> Yeah, I would have to say the same thing. Yeah, I was saying. So, by your own admission, you two are lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterers at heart, and you're a thieving, blasphemous adulterer at heart. No, you didn't thief, you just lied. You're a lying, blasphemous yeah. adulterer. So on Judgment Day, do you think you'll be innocent or guilty? Oh, I'll be guilty with a capital G. <laughs> yeah, me too. If that's the way, I guess I'll be penalized. Yeah. So, will you go to heaven or hell? Uh, well, I don't believe in it, so I, when I die, I'm just going to be nothing. Well, that's interesting. If I'm walking down a freeway and I don't believe in trucks, is it going to change reality? Uh, trucks is a real thing, and the trucks is right in front of you. To me, I, I, I can't see hell. I don't know if it's true. I mean, they say hell's in the center of the earth. I think it's just a bunch of rocks and mold. Well, maybe a bunch of rocks, but the Bible says there is a place called hell, and it's God's judgment upon sin mm -hmm. and upon sinners. So if there's a hell, you're in big trouble. If there's yeah. a so. You, you don't want to take any risk because God gave you a conscience and your own conscience tells you when you do wrong. Mm. Doesn't it? Yeah. So that's a strong testimony to what God says is true. He's written his law upon your heart. Now you know what God did so you wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you have any idea? No. Come ask on, you can do it. Ask for his forgiveness? Oh, it's more than that. Any, you any idea? No. You don't know what God did for you? Oh, he took he his put, life, he, yeah. He, He's on, yeah, he's on the cross. Yeah, he's on the cross. Gave his life for all our lives. That's said He took the punishment for us. So how do you partake in his forgiveness? You've got to repent and put your faith in him. Trust in him like you trust a parachute. Don't just believe. Just call out to God and say, Lord, I trust you with my life and yield your will to his will. And the moment you do that, you'll pass from death to life. God will forgive you and grant you everlasting life. Man. One of the first signs an awakening person is what you've been talking about, knowing that you could be dead in two minutes. That should make you open your heart to the things of God. So uh, think about what we talked about. Do you guys have Bibles at home? Yeah. Actually, I, I, I attended to a church thing a while ago because my friend keeps coming to my door and she keeps talking about it and I went. She's a real friend then, yeah. huh? What about you? Your parents are no doubt praying for you and that's why you've been listening today, huh? Yeah. So you got a Bible at home? Yeah, definitely. You know, I guess the sin that will take most people to hell is lust. Yeah. We just can't help it. We're like moths to a flame. We just keep going back to it. But if you get right with God, God will give you a new heart with new desires, and he will give you the power to turn, turn the other way. And this is what Jesus said about lust. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is better to enter heaven without an eye than go to hell with both your eyes, where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. So let the fear of God fill your heart and realize it's better you to be blind and not be able to lust and go to heaven than have your eyes and end up in hell. Because we're talking about eternity, 
not just a short space of time on Earth. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening. Right, You've been man. really good. Thank you. For yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jesus talks more about hell and punishment uh, than all the rest of the uh, authors and speakers in the Bible put together. talks about it a great deal. And it doesn't make any sense if somehow everyone's going to be saved at the end, that Jesus would be warning about the wrath to come, uh, talking about uh, the uh, hell in which the wor their worm dieth not, and that sort of thing. So uh, I think, obviously, that though God certainly loves everything he has made, Psalm 145, uh, doesn't want anyone to die. There's plenty of uh, universal sounding places in the scripture that talks about God's love for everyone. But Jesus' teaching about hell indicates that no, not everyone will be saved. Welcome to Creation Minute, I'm Eric Hoven. In this episode, we want to discuss how big is big. To find that out, let's go to the simulation room. With a diameter of nearly 8,000 miles, the Earth is big. But not that big when you compare it to, say, Jupiter or even the Sun. Or when you step outside of our solar system, stars like Arcturus or Antares. And just when you don't think it can get any bigger, it does. Wow. That's the Earth. Kind of puts things in perspective, doesn't it? No wonder God says, heaven is my throne and the Earth my footstool. To learn more about creation, visit us at creationminute.com. Wow, really cool. Big is big. <laughs> but joining me right now is, if you just saw him, Eric Hoven from Pensacola, Florida. Let's welcome him. How are you, my friend? Doing wonderful, Paul. Thank you. Eric is a much sought after speaker in the cre creation versus uh, evolution debate, serves as the president of creation science evangelism, yeah. becoming one of the most foremost authorities of science in the Bible. How'd you get into this whole thing? Well, I didn't have a whole lot of choice. Dear old dad said, I know what you're doing when you get out of school <laughs> since I didn't have a clue. And so my dad said, hey, if you could go present this material, uh, there's, a, there's a girl's home that would love to have this material presented. So I went over a seven week period and just started presenting creation versus evolution. Here's the facts. Here's what it means. There is a God. There is a creator. And this is the repercussions of that. We're going to be held accountable to him one day. And obviously, I know you had a lot of information from your father's work. But yeah. as a kid, did you ever, like, doubt that? Or did you have to prove it for yourself? Well, growing up, Dad knew everything. So <laughs> I think it was really around the age of 21 years old that I went, 20 to 21 years old, that I went through my is this real? I right. mean, is this book that I've been told is the perfect word of God, is, is it really that? It. And I went on my own journey. I mean, I read some of Richard Dawkins' materials, and I went, wow, I can see how people could so easily get sucked in to what he says. And it was uh, through that journey that I discovered God is God, Amen. and we, we are absolutely 100% right. We don't believe in the God that maybe exists. Yeah. We believe in the God that absolutely exists. Good, good. Yeah. Now, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit because people, you know, you're just a fanatic. You, you know, you've been brainwashed. Your dad <laughs> taught you all this stuff. But, you know, if someone walks up to you on the street and says, give me proof that God exists, what do you tell them? Well, there's a number of ways you could go with that. I, I break the proofs of God down into three basic categories. Okay. Uh, experiential. I could share a testimony. If it's somebody that I felt like I could share a testimony with, much like Paul told about his testimony on the road to Damascus. Correct. So you got the experiential. You got evidential. I, if it's somebody that had a logical brain that really wanted the evidence, I could share pieces of evidence with them on how we know, uh, the, you know the, the truth about uh, the creation, uh, intelligent mm -hmm. design information, dema design mm -hmm. demands a designer. Or I could go and I could share with them the essential proof that God exists. Mm -hmm. The essential proof is that without God, you can't even know anything. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge the very basis of their worldview, saying, well, how can you argue against God because every argument you make against God is going to assume God? Right. 
it, it would be like me arguing against the existence of air. Mm -hmm. I, I got to use air to make my argument. Or mm -hmm. me saying, I don't speak a word of English. Well, you just did. Every, <laughs> every argument against God has to assume God. It assumes consciousness. Okay. It assumes thought. Right. It assumes logic, none of which can be accounted for apart from God. Yeah. Atheists have to rely on nothing created something. Yes. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And that very leap, trying to say that nothing created something, <laughs> How, again, it, it kind of blows your mind a little bit to even start thinking in those dimensions. But again, how do you deal with that? There is a passage in Romans that has totally changed the way I deal with it. Romans okay. chapter 1 verse 18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men mm -hmm. who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Another version says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In order to suppress the truth, you have to have the truth. Right. So... They know God exists, right. but they are suppressing that truth. You remember the passage in Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, where the Bible says, the brilliant mathematician has said in his heart, there is no God. Right. Wait a minute. No. The amazing atheist has said in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't it. The scholarly scientist. No, no. It's, it's the fool that has said in his heart, there is, there no. is no God. That's right. To argue against the existence of God, the Bible says, is reduced to foolishness. That passage goes on in verses 19, 20, 21, and 22, 22 to say, in verse 20, For the invisible things of Him are clearly seen from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's right. And then verse 22, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yeah. To argue against the existence of God is mm. foolishness. It yeah. really is. Well, and like I mentioned earlier, I mean, evolution is taught as fact in our universities, on television, like I said, on the Discovery <laughs> Channel. Yep. You can't watch anything on birds or reptiles without them talking about how that reptile evolved exactly. from something else. And it, it really kind of is an assault a little bit. But you speak to young people, college mm -hmm. students, high school kids, what are they, I know they've, they've got to be torn and, and get pulled back and forth. What are they saying? They, um, one of two things. The reason people suppress the truth, the Bible says, is because of sin. The mm -hmm. Bible says in Second Peter chapter 3 uh, that scoffers are going to come in the last days and they are going to be willingly ignorant of a few things. And it says they're going to scoff at the Bible because of the lust of their flesh, because of their lusts. Right. People don't scoff at the Bible because of science. They scoff at the Bible because of sin. Right. It was um, mm, G, um, good. Uh, the, uh, Dar Charles Darwin's bulldog, uh, Thomas Huxley, his mm. grandson Julian Huxley, was quoted as saying, I suppose the reason we leapt at the origin of species was because the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Mm. Ooh. And that's exactly what the scripture <laughs> teaches us. They well. want to serve themselves. Humanism says the end of all being is the happiness of man. The reason we, we exist is for man's happiness. Right. Christianity says, oh no, my friend, the reason we exist is for the glory of God That's Almighty. Correct. correct. So two totally different worldviews. So yeah, I, I, was, I was speaking to a group of, uh, of girls on Monday, and uh, it was a, a girl's home that I go to every Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. um, and after we got done talking about the proof of God, that was the subject, the proof of God, mm -hmm. we discussed the God and showed the proof of God that, like I said, it doesn't maybe exist, not even probably exist. Mm -hmm that has to exist. In order to know anything, you have to have this God. In yeah. order to even make sense of the world, you have to have this God. Even Albert Einstein understood that. He was right. quoted as saying that. Um, so we got through that, and then we went into the ramifications of it. And when they saw the ramifications that there really is, not just maybe a God, mm -hmm. absolutely a God, then we were able to get right into the law of God. If, if there is a God, and he made this world, that means he owns it. Mm -hmm. That means he can put rules down. That's that right. means he can hold us accountable for those, for, uh, to those rules. And if we break them, we're, we're in real trouble. Right. And, and we got to look at what Jesus Christ did on the cross, right. which is what it's all about. That's right. So we, we got to take them from the absolute proof of God into what, are the, what does that mean? Yeah. It means we can have a Savior. Yes, we yeah. messed up, but there's a Savior that came 2,000 years ago Amen. and died the death of the cross for us. What have you heard uh, about, and I've heard this many times, that somehow... God used evolution to create animals and species and, and this and that, that evolution was part of his creation plan. 
Well, to answer that, I'd first have to say, what's going to be our authority? How are we going to decide if God used evolution or if God did not use evolution? Yeah. Are we going to arm wrestle over it? Yeah. <laughs> you might win that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are, we going to, are we going to take a poll, you know, a survey, public opinion, vote on it? Yeah. How are we going to determine what the, what the truth is? Yeah. I say the only way to determine truth, and it is, you find, is to go to the authority of Scripture. Yeah. What does God's Word say? God's Word says, no, He didn't use evolution. God made it right the very first time. Good. Uh, I, it's That's funny good. because to believe that God used evolution, I'm going, that's, to me, a really dumb God. That's not the yeah. God of the Bible. That's a God that uses millions of years of death and struggle to finally get us what He wants. Yeah. That doesn't make sense at all. That's good. God says in His Word, in the beginning, He made it. He makes it very clear that's He great. did that. So what's going to be my authority? God's Word. And God's Word Amen. says, no evolution here. We were made, we were created in the image of God Almighty. Amen. And I, I Amen. don't question that. That's good. I don't question that. You know, we've only got a couple minutes left, but you, how do you, bring this home a little bit. I mean, if we are confronted with somebody at work tomorrow or one of our coworkers and just says, you know, those crazy Christians, they believe this, they believe that, there is no God. What, give me step one. What okay. do we do? Okay, 1 Peter 3.15 says, uh, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. First and foremost, don't believe them when they say they're an atheist. Because Romans says there is no atheist. Everybody believes in God. Yeah. So why am I going to take his word that he's an atheist when God's word says he's not? He knows I exist. He's suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. That's Amen. what's going on. Good. So, uh, anyway, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer. If you're not studying, like Timothy says, to show yourself an approved workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, well, then i got to question how dedicated you are as a Christian. Yeah. To really bring this into perspective, though, there are three basic arguments against God. Well, I boil them down to three basic uh, uh, arguments against God. Every argument against God is either going to be a moral argument. Right or a scientific argument, right. or a logical argument. Correct. Logical argument would be, well, what about contradictions in the Bible? Right. Now, I could go and try to explain right. those, or I could ask them, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why are contradictions wrong? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because their worldview cannot account for it the laws of logic that make a contradiction wrong. Correct. Um, a moral argument, well, the God of the Old Testament is a wicked God. Or a bad God. That assumes good and bad. Where does good and bad right. come from? That's where I'm going to go. Or is an angry God. Hold on. Yeah. You're standing on my worldview. You're saying there is good and bad. Right. In order to argue against my worldview. You're trying to use air to argue against air. That's right. And, you know, there's uh, two verses in Proverbs 26. Verse 4 says, answer not a fool according to his folly. Good. Verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly. Mm -hmm. Don't answer the way he wants to answer. Don't grant him the ability to even think apart from the God of the Bible. Right. That's good. Our job is to do what verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Shut the mouth of the fool. Show them their own worldview good. doesn't match up with what they believe. Oh, good word. Good word. Eric, bless you, Thank my you, friend. Paul. I go so quick. <laughs> but if they want more information on your ministry, or you, I know you have tapes and DVDs and we, things that you can provide. We have a great resource online that has lots of free stuff, lots of stuff you can get. Yeah. Dr. Dino, D-R-D-I-N-O dot com. People can go there. There's so much to learn. And Amen. we need to be ready always to yeah. give an answer, just like the Bible says. I like what you said. Arm yourself, yes. Christians. We need the information because there is a hurting dying world out there, mm. and we have the answers, yes, but we've got to really we've be prepared, and we've exactly. got to share it. But uh, Eric, thank you again for oh. these little creation minutes. We're going to yeah. kind of be playing them uh, throughout the program and, and little snippets on really what creation and evidence is all about. Let's take a look at one more. Welcome to Creation Minute. I'm Eric Hoven. Today, let me give you the evolutionary formula to make a universe. Start with some nothing, add to that some more nothing, then let's add some time. Then let's add some more time. We've got it. It's a perfectly balanced universe. Look at that sun, moon, stars, planets. Everything's orbiting in perfect balance and order. You know, evolutionists theorize that this formula can enable everything to make itself, even people with the exception of complicated man-made things like a microscope or 
a toothpick, but everything else about us in nature is the result of random chance and time. You don't even need raw materials. Those will make themselves. To learn more about creation, visit us at creationminute.com. You need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion, perhaps, at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to, to step out of the crowd even if no one follows after Jesus Christ. You'd be willing to stand if you're the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. That's the cost factor. You would have to be willing to suffer persecution for Christ. And let me tell you, it will come. It might even cost you your life. He is not coming to play games. He is not coming to be docile. He is coming to dominate and He is coming to slaughter. He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. And at the end of this age, He will bolt out of heaven on a white steed, and His garments are dripped in blood, the blood of His own enemies, and He is coming back to conquer and to damn. You need to make terms of peace with this coming king or you will be subjected in damnation forever. And Jesus Christ has made terms of peace. You need to settle out of court with him. You do not want to go into that final day of conflict with Christ. For he will be ruthless in the execution of his justice. But he offers you mercy today. He will agree to terms of surrender. He will agree to terms of peace. But they are his terms of peace, not ours. And his terms of peace are very simply this. You must hate your own father and mother and brother and sister and even your own life more than me or you cannot be my disciple and you must take up a cross and follow me or you cannot be my disciple and if you do not, you will meet me in the final judgment and it will glorify God in your destruction. He is pressing you for a decision. He will not be put off. You cannot hit the mute button any longer in your heart. You must answer to Him. In verse 33, so then. Conclusion. None of you can be my disciple. He is saying none of you can be a true Christian. None of you can be in my kingdom. None of you can be in right relationship with me or the Father. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. What is our Lord saying? He's not backing off. He is increasing the commitment that he is calling for with every line of this section. Well, he's not saying that you have to buy your way into the kingdom of heaven, for none of us have enough gold and none of us have enough silver to ever remove the stain of sin that has defiled our inner soul. What is he saying? Who does not give up all of his own possessions? Well, this must be taken in context with other texts of Scripture. And let me just cut to the bottom line of the bottom line. You must transfer 
the ownership of all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. That's what He's saying. Your life is no longer your life, it is now His life. Your time is no longer your time, it is now His time. Your possessions are no longer your possessions, they are now His possessions. Your future is no longer your future, it is now His future. Your treasure is no longer your treasure, it is now His treasure. And you have transferred all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. That's what it is to meet His terms of peace. Yet the exchange is not bartered or bought with real money, but it is purchased with the total, complete surrender of your life to Christ. That's what saving faith is. It is coming to the end of yourself and completely and entirely entrusting all that you are and all that you have to all that He is. This is your eternal soul. This is the only life you will ever live. This deals with the only eternity you will ever have. And so he says, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, meaning it gives evidence that it was never true salt to begin with, with what will it be seasoned? And the answer is nothing. Verse 35, it is useless either for the soul or for the manure pile. It's just no good to anyone. Not to God, not to Christ, not to the kingdom, not to the movement. You're just taking up a seat for someone else. There were other people who were trying to get into this. It is useless either for the soil. You're not even worth the toilet, spiritually speaking. Because you have not come to the place of total surrender of your life and supreme allegiance and supreme loyalty to Christ, you have not yet come under the Lordship of Christ and taken up a cross to follow after Him. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You need to give strictest attention to what God has said in His Son. For God has spoken in His Son to us in this conference. And God has brought every one of us to this place. Not a one of us is here by accident or by happenstance, and it is the goodness of God and the mercy of God that has brought you to this place where you have heard of Isaiah 53. You have heard of the suffering Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who upon that cross became sin for us. Upon that cross, He died to self that He might live for us and that He might bear our sins and iniquities upon that tree and purchase our salvation. And there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And He is calling out to you today. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will take you in and receive you unto myself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my burden is easy and my yoke is light. It is, it is. You will have the weight of sin lifted off of you. And you will have now the yoke of Christ upon you. And He gets into that yoke with you. And He pulls with you. But it will require the total commitment of your life to Him. Oh, how we ought to search our hearts here today. Have I come to this place of total commitment in my life? Have I yielded my life to the sovereign lordship of Him who died upon the cross for me? 
I want you to know that the gates of paradise have been swung open to you. And the narrow gate is open. And if you will take a step of faith and come through this narrow gate and commit your life to Him, despite the strength of His words, He also says, Him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He is calling you today to come, to come to Him, to take a step of faith and to come to Him. But if you come to Him, don't play games. You must surrender to Christ. At this moment, God commands all men to repent and believe that today is the day of salvation, that you are to flee from the wrath to come, to flee from the law of Moses that condemns you into the city of refuge who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Run to Him. Repentance is simply giving up to stop fighting against God and to stop attempting to gain your own salvation through your own works, to literally give up and fall upon Christ. That is salvation. So that you say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And when that seed grows in you to the point where you know that your standing before God is 100 absolutely percent based and founded upon the perfect work and merit of Jesus Christ, then you stand before Him with confidence, knowing that all your sins have been atoned for and that you are righteous in Christ. Come to Him. Now, one other bit of evidence that Christians tried to tell me in my investigation, they said, well, you know, another thing, Lee, you need to believe what the disciples were saying about Jesus because they were willing to die horrific deaths without ever disavowing their claim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who proved it by raising from the dead. And I said, that's not evidence. Give me a break. I mean, there have been religious martyrs throughout history who have been willing to die for their faith, right? September 11th, hello? What about that? What? Question, why were those terrorists willing to die that way? It was obvious. They were willing to die that way because they sincerely believed with all of their heart that if they died in that manner, they would instantly go to heaven to be with their God. They believed it sincerely. And believing it, they were willing to die for their faith. So I tell these people, don't tell me that the fact that the disciples were willing to die for their faith means anything. And I'll never forget, the guy looked at me and said, no, Lee, you're missing the point. You're missing the difference between what the disciples did and, for instance, what, put in modern terms, what those terrorists did. I said, well, what's the difference? And this is what he told me. This is so powerful. He said, Lee, people will die for their religious beliefs if they sincerely believe their beliefs are true, right? I said, that's right. He said, but people will not die for their religious beliefs if they know their beliefs are false, right? I said, well, that's true. Nobody's going to die for a lie. I said, okay, then follow me on this. All of, his, all of Christianity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. 
If he, if he came back from the dead, he is authenticating and proving his claim to being the Son of God. Everything hinges on that. The disciples in all of history were in a unique position. They didn't just believe sincerely that Jesus returned from the dead. They were in a position to know for a fact. They touched him. They ate with him. They talked with him. They knew this wasn't a trick or hallucination. They knew the truth. And knowing the truth, they were willing to die for it. You see the difference? The fact that those terrorists are willing to die for it says nothing about the truth of Islam, does it? It just means they sincerely believe whatever it proclaims or whatever they interpret it as being. The disciples didn't just believe Jesus returned from the dead and thus proved he's the Son of God. They knew it for a fact. And knowing it for a fact, they were willing to die for it. Do you see the difference? I looked all throughout history. I couldn't find one example of anybody anywhere who knowingly and willingly died for a lie. And I said, the disciples knew whether Jesus came back or whether he didn't. They didn't just believe it. They knew it. And knowing it, they were willing to die for it. Therefore, their action, their willingness to die for it, says something to us about the truth of the resurrection. Unlike somebody who just believes something and has no personal evidence one way or the other for it. And I said, you know, that is a powerful bit of corroboration about the truth of Christianity. 